Okay. So I am very excited to introduce Dr. Anna Marie Lachance. Um, uh, Dr. Anna Marie Lachance is a chemical engineer and a STEM educator with numerous professional and creative projects. Anna transitioned at the age of 22 while getting her PhD in chemical and biomolecular engineering at the University of Connecticut. She has served. Oh. Go Huskies. I was so scared for a second. <laughs> I thought I messed up bad again. Um, okay. I said 2003 instead of 2023, which is a big oh. difference in, in ages um, or accomplishments. Okay. I'm not she, that old. <laughs> she has served as a member of several graduate student organizations and has been widely recognized for her research, teaching, and mentorship, most recently with the 2021 Connecticut Women of Innovation Award um, in the Inspiring STEM Equitability category by the Connecticut Technology Council. Anna was the first openly transgender or non-binary person to win in any category in the award's 17-year history. Anna is currently working as a lecturer Stop. for the department <laughs> for the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. So please welcome Dr. Lachance. Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Anna Marie Lachance, but Anna's fine. We're tight like that. Um, I'm coming to you from Nipbuck and Pecumtuck land, currently referred to as Amherst, Massachusetts. For accessibility purposes, I'll share that I'm a white woman with dark blonde hair and a rock and plum blazer. Um, hello, especially to the online folks, happy to see you. Um, if you've been wondering who's that tall lesbian with the cool jacket, I'm a faculty at EMS Amherst and a DI consultant and content creator working to uplift trans perspectives and help STEM spaces become more trans inclusive. I am an out and proud trans woman, hello. I am here not as a pain researcher, um, but as a community advocate and as a patient to share my story. Rajam kindly asked me to come here to share my own story dealing with pain and to talk about the unique challenges that trans people face in the healthcare system, so here I am. By the way, it was such a treat seeing Meryl's talk, and now I don't have to spend five minutes defining cisgender versus transgender. Um, very convenient. Thank you, Meryl. Um, but anyway, we just learned about gender-affirming healthcare uh, in the medical context that usually refers to hormone replacement therapy and gender-affirming surgery. Just call it gender-affirming, gender-confirming, whatever. Uh, I just want to start by once again reiterating that there's a, you know, there's a lot of stigma and misunderstandings around trans care. The science is very clear. Um, trans people exist. Trans affirming care saves lives. For years now, science has shown overwhelming positive outcomes for youth who are able to socially transition and adults who are able to both socially and medically transition, which is why all these major medical organizing bodies have guidelines about how to provide, uh, safely provide gender affirming care to trans people of all ages. In fact, just last week, the American Psychological Association, representing 157,000 members, issued a resolution calling for an end to trans care bans and misinformation around care. Um, so that's good. That's good. Now, gender affirming health care, hormones and surgery, is important, as we just talked about. Um, perhaps some of you here engage in that type of work to some capacity. Maybe you're a physical therapist healing trans patients after their surgery. Um, what I'm here to convince you of is that no matter what kind of care you do, you could be doing more to serve the trans community, a historically underserved or unserved uh, community. We're starting to see now, and what I'm gonna provide for you today is a sort of 10,000 foot view of trans care and meta-analyses and things. What we're starting to see in 2023, 2024 are more comprehensive studies about trans patients and what they expect out of healthcare. What a lot of it comes down to is one, basic respect, uh, and two, being knowledgeable about what trans people go through, what our risk factors are, what our motivations are for pursuing the kind of care we do, and what we want from our providers. These are testimonials from a study just a couple months ago in the Bulletin of Applied Trans Studies, or BATS. Um, it's a group um, run by the Center for Applied Trans Studies, or CATS, because if you give trans people the opportunity to name something, they will reference CATS. Um, and it goes over testimonials from trans patients regarding their experiences with gender uh, or uh, general practitioners from the UK. These are just a few stories, but we can see some pretty clear patterns emerging. Trans people being objectified, uh, emotionally preparing to be misgendered at a healthcare setting, and even people hiding symptoms from their doctors out of fear they won't be taken seriously, or that it'll somehow be used to delegitimize their trans identity, or worse, be used to as, as an excuse to cut them off from gender-affirming healthcare. 
I hope we can all agree that having our basic identity respected is something we should be able to expect from all healthcare professionals, whether we're cis or trans. Um, and I hope that we can all agree that nobody feels uh, deserves to feel triggered or on the defensive when they go to a doctor, feeling like they have to put an extra effort to advocate for themselves. But also we see good stories too, like in the bottom right here, the best practitioners are extremely well informed about trans healthcare. They understand where the healthcare system fails trans people and they're sympathetic as to why mm -hmm. trans people might avoid doctors or self-medicate or something like that. Remember these aren't, uh, these are GPs, our equivalent of PCPs, not necessarily people providing hormones or surgeries, but an important part of their healthcare team, their healthcare network. Um, what I wanna provide for you today is my own story of being trans in healthcare, the healthcare professionals who've been supportive and unsupportive, and what we can learn from them. And along the way, I'll be backing up my story with data about how trans people engage with the healthcare system and giving you actionable items, practical items, how to make your practice trans affirming, even if your practice has nothing to do with the endocrine system. Sound fun? Yeah, yeah. yeah awesome. So again, I could skip the preamble. Thank you, Meryl. Um, <laughs> But things like you can identify as a gender that's different than your sex, that's so crazy. Um, for the sake of time, I'll forgo the trans 101. And I hope we can agree on the following items, transition care is healthcare and often medically necessary. Trans people deserve to be here and happy. We all have a role in supporting the trans community, every single one of us. It's not just you know trans people have to advocate for themselves. We all have a role in supporting marginalized people. And I hope we can all get down with that. Um, so without further ado, what's my own story? Um, and talking about how I've come into my own as a trans person and also a STEM educator and advocate for others in many different capacities, not just trans people, but also others. Um, so starting is how I usually tell my story. Um, starting around age 16, I did FIRST Robotics. Anyone who did FIRST Robotics in here? No, not the crowd. Okay, cool. Well, they, my, my high school sport, instead of being uh, basketball or something, it was making robots, 120 pound robots that could kick soccer balls around. It was very fun. So I discovered my love of engineering and chemistry concurrently. Maybe you see where this is going now that I have a PhD in chemical engineering. 2011 was also the first time I said, hmm, perhaps I'm not a man, but maybe we'll deal with that later. Uh, maybe in like six years, I don't know. Um, and at the time I went by the nickname Chansey. I don't know if anyone here has played the Pokemon games, but that's the name of a Pokemon and also my last name, Lachance. So it was a nickname based off that. And I increasingly realized throughout my life that that's a name that I used to avoid using my dead name. But anyway, um, at age 18, I started my undergraduate degree in chemical engineering at UConn, woo. And I also, around 2013, took this photo of myself. My friend put lipstick on me as a joke. It felt really good, but I continued to not think about it um, <laughs> for four years. Um, and then around age 22, I started my PhD in chemical engineering at UConn. And I had the opportunity to teach a course of my own. Um, so I was taking three graduate classes thermodynamics, chemical reaction kinetics, and heat, uh, heat and mass transfer or fluid mechanics, and also teaching a whole course by myself. And that's around the time that I also started my transition. So because I was getting my PhD, I decided, hey, let's stop going by this juvenile uh, Pokemon nickname and start going by my legal name because I'm gonna be a doctor one day, so I better be professional. And I quickly realized, oh my God, ouch, nope, ouch, that hurts, ow. Um, and it quickly, um, realize how much I hated using that name. And that was the impetus for me starting to think about and having normal cisgender thoughts, like, you know, the effects of feminizing HRT sound pretty nice, um, before ultimately coming out to myself on October 27th, 2017. The cool thing about being trans is you get all these birthdays, these extra birthdays and anniversaries or traniversaries. Um, <laughs> I also started researching into polymer nanocomposite films, um, but I did not come out at work for almost another year. So I started doing this research, started living my days as one person, and then on nights and weekends getting to be Anna Marie. It was a really dark and weird time, and it prevented me from showing up fully in my work and in my life and in my relationships. Um, but after enough time and patience and getting some of my legal documents in order, I did come out at work eventually, another anniversary, woohoo, um, almost a year later. Um, and I want to stress that, you know, coming out really helped me bring my full self into my work and really launch my career into success. So for the next few years, I did research, mentoring, teaching nonstop. I mentored um, 15 undergraduate students in the lab, uh, all of them. Uh, young women in STEM, and some of them who then went on to get PhDs in themselves. 
I also taught one man because you know diversity higher. Um, but uh, <laughs> I also along that time was very, very involved. I learned, uh, I took a nine credit certificate program in college instruction and I participated in a million different on-campus groups from OSTEM or out in STEM to the John Loft Leadership Academy, which I co-founded as the first ever um, program for specifically engineering graduate students, uh, the first ever professional development program for that type of student in the country. And I did a bunch of local activism as well, getting involved with local politics and the Green Party, getting uh, queer and trans people elected to local office. So I was very involved. Um, and then another anniversary for me, defended my P dissertation, became Anna Marie PhD. And around this time, I started to say, hey, I have this whole STEM story and this whole queer story. How do I merge them together? And I realized that they're not so separate. I can't separate my STEM story from my gender story. I can't separate my, I can't like hang my gender at the door when I go to work or whatever. So how do I fuse these two? How can I merge my STEM knowledge and use it to become an advocate for others? And how do I use my advocacy work and fuse it and teach social justice to STEM people? So as I joined UMass in fall 2022, I started working towards an integrated feminist and anti-colonial um, STEM practice, um, but this is a healthcare conference, so why am I telling you all this? Um, other than the fact that I made this slide two years ago and I haven't stopped using it. Um, so one for one to show you that my journey as a professional is inseparable from my gender journey. Um, to show you that when trans people are supported in their transition in all ways, they don't just live, they thrive. They become successful in their careers instead of just hiding away in a literal and proverbial closet. And two, to sh or three, <laughs> to show you how I got to be doing such interdisciplinary work in the first place. When I transitioned, I was the only out person in the College of Engineering at UConn, and one of the only out LGBT people in general. So while I was incredibly lonely <laughs> in my field, I was forced to make friends in other places, from queer people earning their PhDs in other disciplines, to trans sex workers of color who never went to college in the first place. So when I talk here, uh, I'm not just telling you my own story, I'm doing my best to share the aggregate stories and experiences of trans people from all walks of life because we are a very, very diverse group of people and no one story can tell you everything. I can only tell you my story and try to provide that 10,000 foot view. So let me try to tell you the healthcare version of my story, which I developed just for this conference, yay. So like I said, 2017 came out to myself as trans. At the time, it was my very first semester as a PhD student at UConn, a very stressful job. Uh, anyone who's gotten a PhD can tell you. So I'd already started seeing a therapist at Student Health and Wellness, or SHAW, uh, S-H-A-W. I had been seeing this counselor for a few weeks. He was a grad student pursuing a master's in psychology or something, and our first session of November 2017, I excitedly told him that uh, I would now be pursuing a gender transition, yay. And I was told by this therapist at Shaw, that's great, we can't help you here. And then he recommended that I seek counseling elsewhere. Point blank, I was told that nobody there was trans or knew anything about trans people. They would not be able to provide any recommendations for gender affirming care practitioners. Um, the only thing they were able to provide was a list of names of off-campus therapists who might, maybe, be able to connect me with the healthcare that I need. Um, I pretty straightforwardly told them I was trans and they told me to leave. Not in even a bigoted way, like, get out of here, you insert slur here, just with a smile on my face, that's great. I'll leave, uh, we can't help you. Um, they weren't even rude or mean about it. Um, now remind, re remember, at the time I was going through a lot, Family rejection, fearing a loss of career prospects, feeling body dysmorphia and a general lack of confidence in myself. Naturally, I was worried about how this would affect my performance in my job or in my classes or my role as a teaching assistant um, and more, but apparently none of those things were things that UConn's student health and wellness uh, could help me with because I was transgender. Uh, these kinds of experiences are unfortunately pretty common among trans people, but also in the broader LGBTQ community. Um, and when I talk about LGBTQ, that's cisgender people who are also queer, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, or questioning. Um, according to a survey by American Progress, among lesbian, gay, bisexual, and queer respondents who had visited a doctor or healthcare provider in the year before this survey, 8% um, said a doctor or healthcare provider refused to see them, 
Uh, 6% say a doctor or healthcare provider refused to give them health care because of their actual perceived sexual orientation, um, and the list goes on. And I want you to look at how these numbers change when we look about when we look at trans populations. Ready? Bam. Um, they all go up, right? Um, in the same study as before, among transgender people who had visited a doctor or healthcare provider's office in the past year, 29% that they had been refused service because of their gender identity. 12% say they refused service. Um, the list just goes on, and the list increases also with incidences of assault or rape or harsh or abusive language. Um, so our community knows about this marginalization, which is why 6.7% of LGBTQ people and 22% of trans people don't seek the medical care that they need because they fear mistreatment from their doctors. And that number goes up to 42% for houseless trans people. So the lesson, first big lesson of the day, um, discrimination discourages LGBTQ people from seeking health care. Um, they're pushed out of healthcare space, uh, spaces, even when that care has little or nothing to do with the process of transitioning, of getting uh, specifically hormones or gender affirming surgery. Um, have you heard of trans broken arm syndrome? It's a fun community term for when you go to see a doctor for a broken arm, but you're trans, so you get refused service. Or you're trans, so the physician is really touchy and like freezes up and they don't really know what to do because they're afraid that if they treat you, it'll somehow mess with your endocrine system when like, dude, it's a broken arm. Um, unsurprisingly, this care refusal is significantly worse um, in Republican states too, according to some of these links. And by the way, I'll happily share these slides with whoever. Just email me and I'll share you these slides and you can go through all these sources um, and all these analyses. But all trans people, by virtue of being people, um, deserve adequate health care and they don't deserve to be taken or um, rejected like this, to be sent away like this. Um, so. Step one of my healthcare journey, already going great. Um, starting in November, December 2017, I started seeing a new therapist who was off campus. Her name was Dr. Liza. Um, she was great. She listened to my problems and heard me out, but she still wouldn't write my letters of referral to an endocrinologist, something that I was seeking, and also weirdly took the side of my mom when I talked to her about how she refused to accept my transition, but that's a whole other story. Um, I was 22 at the time and I was still on my parents' insurance. And my mom actually threatened to kick me off my health insurance if I started hormones without her permission, even though I was an adult and had autonomy over what to do with my body. But anyway, my care was contingent on this other person not finding out that I was looking to receive it. So other big lesson of the day, privacy is everything. Um, according to the Trevor Project, 28% uh, of LGBTQ youth reported experiencing homelessness or housing instability at some point in their lives. And those who did had two to four times the odds of reporting depression, anxiety, self-harm, considering suicide and attempting suicide compared, with, compared to those with stable housing. And you can see some other awful statistics right here. So my tip for you is to look at what their practices have done to protect um, people's privacy. Little things like, you know, can we use this name when we contact you on your welcome form can go a long way to protect your, the identities and transition status of the people you're seeking, especially with younger people. Um, even getting as granular as what is your preferred contact method and what name should we use if we call you directly and what name should we use if we mail you something. All of these could be questions that you ask either on your intake form or just directly to your patient when you're talking to them. Um, trans disclosure is a really complicated subject, even in medical settings. So someone might come to you and then you find out when you actually are sitting in the room with them that they're trans and they're seeking something. So um, make sure you're adequately providing them the care and privacy that they need. Uh, speaking of sign-up forms and intake forms, uh, you might have had a lot of patients self-identify their gender identity at some point in their intake process. Um, how many of you might have a form that looks like this? Gender, male or female, or gender, male, female, transgender, other, I prefer not to say. You would think that this bottom right form is better than the first, I guess technically it is, but first of all, male and female refer to sex, not gender, as we established. Um, man and woman would be gender. Also, these radio buttons imply that uh, transgender is a third mutually exclusive category when in fact transgender is an adjective that can be appended to either man or woman, male or female. 
which brings us to an important issue that trans people face all the time, navigating the legal system, especially in healthcare settings. Many of us choose a new name when we socially transition, and often we don't want to change, or often we want to change the little gender marker on our driver's licenses and other documents to avoid discrimination, weird stares, or having a paper trail down the line. So, do you wanna know how much it cost me to change my name and gender marker in the blue liberal state of Connecticut? I mean, it's one gender, Michael. How much could it cost? $10. Um, so, let's go through it. Um, to do the name change, I first had to make a court date, everyone's favorite, um, to go to a probate court and spend $300 to raise my right hand and, said, and say, I am Anna Marie LeJans, I am not committing tax fraud. Um, and then once I got that document, um, or more specifically, five copies of that document, and you really should be paying money for the extra copies because you're gonna be sending this to banks and all these other places. Um, I went to the Social Security office, everyone's other favorite activity, um, and went, stood there for an hour, changed my name on my Social Security card. And then once I got that in the mail, I was able to get a driver's license at the DMV. Again, long government office lines. Um, and another 30 bucks out of my pocket, and a new passport for 120. Um, so already the money is stacking up, but wait, there's more. That's all just to change your name. Um, to change your gender marker, you need an endocrinologist letter of support, which means you need first months of therapy to get referral to an endocrinologist, and then from there, have a few sessions with that endocrinologist to get a letter of support, and they have to do that um, all timed synchronously <laughs> to um, make sure you have it in time before your new driver's license. Can you see why we get our info from Reddit and Twitter? <laughs> because um, nobody should get their info on transitioning from Twitter or anything from Twitter. And by the way, Twitter is the one thing you're allowed to dead name. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no one else, nothing else. Um, but um, you could see how this is not a very fun activity. So I tell you this for one, um, a lot of people think that transitioning is something that you know, young people do on a whim, like because everyone else is doing it, because it's cool and it's trendy. I don't think of anything less trendy than sitting at the DMV. And also, um, you know, taking all this time uh, off work to go stand in a government office for hours or sitting in a doctor's office to say, yeah, uh-huh, definitely transgender. And then a few weeks later, yep, yeah, uh-huh, definitely still transgender to a bunch of other government officials. Um, a little dehumanizing, gotta say. Um, so the point is, if you have a trans or non-binary patient whose documents aren't all in perfect alignment and synchronicity, maybe the name they write on their intake form is different than the name on their credit card or their insurance, this is why. In fact, only about 30% of trans people change their legal name, probably because of the expensive and time-consuming process that it takes to do so. Um, but numerous studies have shown that having one's legal name changed and recognized is associated with better health outcomes, including lower reports of depression and anxiety, according to these studies right here. So my recommendation, along with others, um, is to make it as easy as possible for your patients to change their name or pronouns or markers within your systems and to give them opportunities to self-identify. So putting pronouns in their intake form or things like that, and just in general, respecting them. People might be coming to you as a patient at all sorts of stages in their transition, whether they just realized they were trans last week or whether they have done all the surgeries and all the things. Um, so patients who are at the very start of their gender journeys say, you know, this may involve having to ask for someone's dead name, uh, as we just said, um, the name they were given at birth before they decided to change it, so please do so tactfully. Remember that they're trusting you with something very delicate and very important, so please be careful. You might, you know, need it for some reason, but just, you know, always refer to them in person, one-to-one, -one, as their actual name, their chosen name, if you will, but it is just their actual name, not their preferred name, their name. Um, same with their pronouns. It's not their preferred pronouns, their, their pronouns. And then maybe on the back end, if you're dealing with insurance stuff, you know, you have to deal with that. But don't make the patient deal with all of that, you know? Um, and by the way, aside from what you can do in your practice, you can also change the way you carry out your research. Um, again, this question has a few problems. Radio buttons, not check boxes. Transgender is a mutually exclusive category. It's unclear whether female plus transgender means a trans woman who identifies as a female or a trans masculine person who was assigned female at birth who then transitioned. Just provide more options. Um, it's also kind of othering to have people select other. So um, these surveys are more inclusive. 
for your research because they have more options and because they separate the question of gender identity and sex in case sex is a component of the mechanism you're trying to understand in your biologically based research. Um, this is also worth considering for planning professional events like conferences, by the way, pronoun badges on conferences, um, or pronouns on conference badges, rather. Um, you don't necessarily need to know in your study whether someone is a cis woman or non-binary or whatever, you just need to know their pronouns um, and things like that. Although in most research scenarios, I would always advise for being as scientifically accurate as possible, which means uses, using phrases like, this study did not, data, did not present data on non-binary individuals. I think that one sentence makes your research a whole lot more accurate, right, if you don't have any non-binary patients. So using inclusive survey design, using trans-inclusive language, this might sound awkward. There's a lot of hullabaloo about saying things like people who menstruate, there's a lot of emotional charge with that, but it is just more scientifically accurate to do so in many cases. Remember that when trans people are erased from scientific studies, they get erased from history, which has impacts across generations for our community. Um, so there are more appropriate ways to do these things. In fact, this is an excellent op-ed from um, three trans scientists in the journal Science um, that make the case for inclusive language. For example, there's a tendency in science to label anything related to the Y chromosome as a feature related to maleness, but that obfuscates the full picture. For example, male pattern baldness, as we call it, is actually associated with the X chromosome. So calling it male pattern baldness, while technically true that it manifests in males or men, I guess, um, is really more true that it's people who have an X chromosome and who have this gene. So you really should look to your mom's dad to see if they're going bald, to see if you might have male pattern baldness. So um, anyway, all these little things add up, all these ways to do gender inclusive language add up in our research settings. For more info, go read that op-ed, it's pretty great. This is actually the whole thing right here, but um, we should move on. Um, here's more about me. Um, so in spring 2018, I moved from this old therapist, this new therapist who actually was herself trans. How cool is that? Um, I was very lucky to have a trans care provider in this way who did write me my letters and I was able to get my gender marker change, yes, love the DMV, um, and start hormones in November 2018. I also came out work, out at work, remember, in September 2018, um, again, two months before hormones and when I only had a few documents, um, so it was awkward navigating the whole HR version of that, um, of changing the name on my pay stubs and things. Again, patients might be coming to you at all stages in their transition. I even got gender-affirming bottom surgery, a uh, gonadectomy in 2020, yay! Um, and things were fine forever um, from there. End of story, just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, I was a pretty healthy patient. I got regular blood work, and over the next few years, my hormone level stabilized. It was all good. A true trans success story. I was living vastly happier, living my best possible life, except for one little thing. Um, oof, March 2020, coronavirus. Uh, it's getting real. Um, so I got sick in the first week of lockdown. Um, and in that first week, that first few months, if you remember, uh, I know we don't like going back there, but a lot of people were cut off from their support networks and no more so than trans people and other queer people who are usually reliant on their social support networks for resource, resources, healthcare, food, et cetera, um, which makes now a good opportunity to talk about risk factors. So a lot of how trans people are treated in the world comes down to a warped perception of science. Like I said before, the science is clear but Americans are largely misinformed about the science, whether it's because of right-wing media insisting that transition care, transition care is dangerous or a failure of biology education to account for the existence of non-cisgender or intersex people. So, you know, that's Marjorie Taylor Greene's sign outside of her office, trust the science. She's making a call to science, a call to this authority about something that's actually just anti-trans rhetoric. Now, this flowchart, saw a lot of fun flowcharts this weekend. Here's mine. Um, this flowchart was created for HIV and AIDS patients. But you could see how it applies to other marginalized groups. We should be thinking about healthcare in terms of systems. Being marginalized leads to rejection, poverty, homelessness, which leads to riskier situations, which leads to worse health outcomes, which leads to more stigma and a vicious cycle. 
In the 1980s, homophobes claimed that God created AIDS to punish gay people, that HIV was a metaphysical manifestation of gay people's discongruity with the so-called natural world. Nobody's supposed to be gay, and that's why they're all getting sick. And now, whenever a trans person gets sick for whatever reason, um, STI-related or not, or is in pain in some fashion, um, transphobes say that it must be because biological men aren't supposed to take estrogen or women aren't supposed to take testosterone. So our bodies are decaying or getting weaker as a result. Nobody's supposed to transition, so what did you expect? Um, so poor outcomes cycle back into more stigma. You know, there's nothing new under the sun. Anti-trans rhetoric is just it, homophobic rhetoric recycled. You know, 30-year nostalgia cycle and all that. Um, and on the flip side, um, things like asexuality or a lack of sexual attraction is also pathologized in healthcare settings. Having a low libido is considered a problem that needs to be fixed and not a valid experience of sexuality. Um, that could be a whole other talk in and of itself. But yeah, due to poverty and all these other factors, some trans people can't afford all the medications and doctor's visits that they need. Um, and so a lot turned to self-medicating. Many of my friends, for example, <laughs> turned to self-medicating with marijuana or tobacco and sometimes harder drugs. And remember how few trans people even seek out healthcare simply due to, to fear of further marginalization. All of this compounds onto trans people in a really complex way. Um, the result of that, you know, going to the doctor and being afraid that they'll judge you for self-medicating for so long um, is what lends itself to trans people being at elevated risk for cancer, heart disease. Um, long COVID in particular, it's still something we're learning about, but according to a U.S. Census Bureau in December 2022, 46% of trans respondents reported experiencing long-term COVID symptoms compared to 32% of cis women and 22% of cisgender men. So all these things compound. Um, the term popular in the discourse is minority stress. I don't know how much I love that term. I would call it like systemic stress or something. But they go beyond little microaggressions, little misgenderings, although those do matter. They can be highly damaging. The bigotry rituals and all this physical violence, the systemic physical violence of being turned away from healthcare systems and the direct you know, physical attacks on us. Um, big content warning, but my community is actually in mourning right now. Um, in March 2024, our community is grieving the loss of Brianna Guy in the UK and Nex Benedict here in the US in Oklahoma, two teenagers who were brutally murdered just for their trans identities. Um, and I'd be remiss not to mention the recent onslaught of anti-trans bills we've been facing in the country. But first, a little history lesson. Magnus Hirschfeld was a gay Jewish scientist who did some of the first research on trans people as early as the 1920s. Um, if you want to look to pain research, maybe look to him, right? Berlin actually had a thriving LGBTQ scene in the early 20th century, including gay nightclubs and the Institute for Sexual Wissenschaft, uh, or the Sexual Research Institute, for, forgive my German. Um, but they provided gender affirming care to trans people in the 20s, the 1920s. Um, and some trans people even worked at the Institute as nurses for other trans patients. So we had patient coordinators, patient advocates. They're doing groundbreaking stuff. Um, groundbreaking research on trans people that actually portrayed us sympathetically rather than as a disorder or a disease, an oddity, an edge case. Um, and because we were portrayed sympathetically in a scientific context, that is actually why it was targeted by the Nazis. So when the Nazi power, the Nazi party rose to power in Germany in 1933, one of the literal first things they did was attack the Institute. All these iconic pictures of book burnings that you might have seen in your history textbooks or online, that's actually all research done by the Institute. Um, it was a deliberate goal of fascists to erase trans people from history and from science and from medical contexts. Adolf Hitler is described as quote, uh, is quoted as describing Magnus Hirschfeld as the most dangerous Jew in the world, all because he helped to normalize trans existence. Science done in such a way that acknowledges trans people is seen as a threat to the status quo and a threat to fascist ideology. So forgive me for being a little freaked out that the Republican Party in America has made it their platform to ban books featuring LGBTQI plus people and other forms of diversity, stop DEI programs in college that support diverse students, and ban trans-affirming medical care for people of all ages. 
Usually these healthcare bans start as attacking youth and then they move up to trans adults later in life. And if you didn't know, there were about um, 500 anti-trans bills proposed in 2023 and another 500 just in the first two months of 2024 alone. So a lot of attacks on trans people. In fact, just last month in Florida, a new memo makes having your sex marker on your driver's license now considered a fraud. Um, so being caught with one is considered a felony. Driving while trans, now a crime in Florida. And many have been calling this a legislative genocide, which has obviously resulted in a lot of trans kids being scared, which is, of course, the point. The cruelty is the point. 86% of trans non-binary youth say that the recent debates about state laws have impacted their mental health. 74% um, feel angry, sad, stressed, hopeless, scared, helpless, nervous. This is not the environment that, you know, young scientists, young anyone should be living in. Obviously, this has cascading effects on their overall health. In fact, big content warning for this one for self-harm and suicide. Um, oh, this is tough. Uh, currently, um, because of all this stigma against trans people and all the stress that our young people, our kids feel, um, the statistic is that 40% or 41%, depending on who you ask, um, of LGBT youth have attempted suicide. Um, this number is often stated as a reason for not allowing people to transition. Um, in fact, sometimes in my comment section of my TikTok videos, people just comment 40%, just no words or other context, just four zero percent sign as an insistence that I should probably do that. Um, what they don't tell you though, what they don't tell you about the statistic is the other half of the statistic, which is that when people have just one supporting adult in their life, that number goes down by 40%. Just one supportive adult makes that number go from 40 to 24 percent. Um, so, the most important thing you can do for trans people in healthcare settings or in all settings is be that one adult. Be that one adult. Um, that's the ultimate lesson here. The combo of minority stress and barriers to healthcare acts is a one-two punch against our community. Um, so, it's important that you understand these risk factors. What leads someone to self-medicate? What leads someone to um, deny themselves care for so long for fear of this discrimination. Um, and also on a practical financial level, things like adopting flexible pay scales um, and providing as many resources to trans patients as possible when it comes to financial assistance is critical. Um, so, um, you know, all of this leads to greater risk of chronic health conditions and poor mental health in trans patients. For example, me. Uh, I just so happen to be a trans person experiencing chronic stress and uh, having these exact barriers right up until 2024. So I first got COVID in March 2020, like I said, um, when things were first shutting down. And then in September 2022, despite my best efforts, um, right as I was starting my job at UMass uh, and experiencing a lot of stress just from starting a new job and all this responsibility, um, I got COVID a second time. And I started shortly thereafter experiencing some chronic pain in my legs. Um, it basically felt like I had just done a really hard hike outside of my skill level all of the time. And this is something I'm still working to diagnose, but you know, um, I was dealing with all the stress. Uh, on, in March 2023, I finally brought this up to a doctor. For a long time, I just decided to deal with it, thinking it would just go away. Um, didn't, still here serving crip realness to this day. Um, when I told my male doctor about this, um, at first he didn't believe me. Uh, when I reported to him, you know, I, I had suspected at the time that something was going on with blood circulation. I had kind of like cold toes and cold, cold fingernails. I even took off my nail polish, something I never do to show him my purple nails. And he said, oh, you look fine. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, mis misogyny, how gender affirming. Um, <laughs> my favorite, it's what, I'm, it's what I've been waiting for all this time, is just for someone to be misogynistic towards me, so I know I'm a woman. Um, <laughs> fortunately, I had learned from my prior experiences in healthcare how to be a good self-advocate, a, a skill that nobody should need to develop, but I did, and I pressed on, um, getting him to refer me to a vascular expert who I saw that summer. 
So when I said, or when I saw this vascular expert, the first thing he asked me to do was explain what being trans was like because he didn't really get it. Um, he didn't really know about HRT or anything, or you know, anything about the surgeries that I had gone by that point, which is funny because one of the risk factors for estrogen in both cis and trans women is increases in the levels of blood clotting factors. That's why pregnant women have a greater risk of blood clots because their estrogen levels are going crazy. So there I was explaining my own risk factors to a Tufts Medical School graduate who I also had to educate about how adjectives work, about you know, woman, trans woman. It was a whole thing. Um, I don't know about you, but I think he should have been the one to know about these blood clotting factors and risk factors better than I could. Um, I spent the better part of my summer getting tests done to actually check the circulation in my legs and the conclusion this doctor reached was that I have reflux in my veins. Okay, that's an answer. Why? He said he didn't know and he didn't provide any suggestions as to how we could find out more. Diagnosis? I don't know. Um, and his big solution? Wear compression socks and see how you feel. I guess that is actionable advice. I didn't hate it, but I was a little unsatisfied. And I still didn't know, I still don't know how much of his lack of knowledge or lack of solutions was simply a dismissal of my health needs on the basis of transphobia or how much is just, hey, we're still understanding long COVID. We don't really know. Um, and there's no way of knowing, which is, again, this frustrating feeling um, is part of why I, and Many trans people tend to go out of our way to seek healthcare practitioners that are themselves LGBTQ because that significantly reduces the risk of this sort of lack of knowledge about what we go through and what our risk factors are. So my, one of my last big lessons to you now is be loud. Um, and you know, our community specifically looks for LGBTQ friendly practitioners or people who are LGBTQ themselves. And if we can't find any, some of us just straight up won't seek care. I had to get through a lot of you know, self-doubt to think, oh, maybe I, should I just give up? Should I just give up seeking care? Until very recently where I started to look into physical therapists again. Um, and actually, um, one thing about us uh, is that if we are well connected, um, we have whisper networks. So we have sometimes lists of safe and unsafe doctors to turn to when we don't really know what we're getting ourselves into before we go to the doctor's office. So, you know, we might have a Google form that we pass around to people in our local community, in our local towns, if our trans community is built up sufficiently far. Um, so if you've had a lot of unsatisfied trans patients in the past, unfortunately, you might already be on one of those lists. Um, but there's also good news. Relationships are built at the speed of trust. Building trust with a community takes a lot of time and effort, but you can start those efforts today. The good thing about these networks is that if a trans patient does have a positive experience with you, they'll tell their friends, who will tell their friends. So if you live in a place where you might, for example, endanger your employees' lives by putting up a bunch of rainbow flags all over the office, you can signal your support in other more subtle ways from the intake form to putting your pronouns in your email signature. And if all else fails, if you really don't feel safe doing all those things, although I suggest you try, um, word can spread. One happy trans patient tells their trans friends, they tell theirs, suddenly you're the, the one practitioner in the city that all the trans people go through for physical therapy. Um, that really happens all the time. Uh, that's happened in most of the cities I've lived in. Um, so despite my frustrations with my vascular doctor, the one thing I'll give him is that he asked. He didn't know about transness, so he politely, and he politely asked, and he seemed to have a bit of an open mind. Asking questions is fine. <laughs> There's no need to freeze up when you have a trans person walk into your office, but it becomes a problem when 100% of the educational burden is on the patient. When they're explaining to you what a pronoun is, that's a little too far. Obviously, you can't know everything about every aspect of the trans experience. You're just, you're only human. But knowing as much as possible is really important. And like these other testimonials have shown, um, it's really satisfying when people know our risk factors. So, like I said, and as we're getting close to time, um, you probably can't learn everything there is to know about our entire community. We're just too diverse. But you can start to be proactive now um, and good news, you've already started. You just watched two talks about this subject. Good for you. So there are, for example, people who aren't like me. 
There are transmasculine and non-binary people who specifically need, for example, gynecological care or other reproductive system-related care. There are trans women of color who face even more challenges in the healthcare system, obviously. One out of three American doctors believe that African Americans can experience more pain than white patients. So yeah, obviously they have a, an increased risk of being turned away or undiagnosed or underdiagnosed for things, as all black patients are. And there's also, you know, other places to learn. There are meta-analyses of trans care that are only starting to be done now. Um, what a time to be alive. Um, believe it or not, questions like how many trans people are there are difficult to answer. Someone asked before about like knowledge about medical records and having pronouns in medical rest records. Um, turns out even within gender clinics, people who treat you know, trans patients, there's no reporting standard for transition care. So an emerging problem in studying trans medicine is depending on which clinic you go to, you'll be classified in different ways. From outdated terms like gender identity disorder to vague terms like male endocrine condition. With all the available medical data that we have, we don't even know how many trans people that there are. So Dr. Avery Everhart, who started the Center for Applied Trans Studies, um, has this great work on this medical geography um, that I'll link here. Um, they are basically the standard for trans-centered research and we can learn so much from them. And of course, not all patients are as simple as biological XY male fully transitioning into female or vice versa female to male. There's a whole massive spectrum of possibilities, including, and this is, can be con considered a separate conversation, uh, intersex identities. In the same way that we can ask how do you gender someone, we can ask how do you uh, assign sex to someone. And the answer is really complicated. You know, you have your chromosomes, obviously, as we may have heard about, um, but also there are other genes, endocrine systems, sex organs, and secondary sex characteristics, all of which can be related, all of which can be in quote unquote alignment with each other, but not always. Um, my gonads and my chromosomes might tell a different story. I've actually never taken a karyotype test, so I don't know my chromosomes. I could be intersex for all I know. Um, but being open to that possibility is really important. Um, and yes, I'll also add that XXXY, that combo represents 98% of the population with 2% of the population being intersex. So we're not just this small, weird edge case that happens super rarely. Um, for example, 2% of the population has red hair, 2% of the population has green eyes. We don't say that there are two hair colors or two eye colors, so why would we say that there's two genders, right? So um, wrapping up here, there are lots of areas to bloom outwards when it comes to scientific research into trans life that aren't necessarily being done at scale. So for example, um, pain-related research for detransitioners or retransitioners that look at people who transition socially or medically and then detransition or retransition into a new form of their gender identity and looking at them in a sympathetic light um, instead of the stigma that they can face from even other trans people. Um, and also, advances in trans-affirming care. So the current standard for HRT is all or nothing. You cut out all your testosterone and you take estrogen. You cut out all your estrogen and you take testosterone. But what if someone wants hyper-specific needs, like they want to have facial hair but none of the other benefits or something? So how do we look into other alternatives that allow that modularity? Um, older people, older trans people. By the way, we have older trans people now. That alone is mind-blowing, right? Um, they're realizing that you know they're going through something that we could kind of call related to menopause. And so um, older trans women who long ago got surgery and are no longer producing testosterone are experimenting with microdosing tea later in life and seeing what the effects of that are. So there's a lot of opportunities for study. And just rapid firing a list of other things you could do in your practice, your research groups, your schools, your conferences. Make being a pro-trans a topic in your professional communities. Conferences like this are a great start, but again, I can't be the only trans voice you listen to. There's a whole constellation of experiences. Um, so your journals, it's really hard to change your name from a journal you've already published in, so advocating for other trans people in your field, really important. Asking conferences in unsupportive states what they're doing to protect trans attendees. Um, advocating for your state to be a sanctuary state, so on and so forth. Um, a lot of great stuff to do. For example, the chemical engineering conference was in Florida this past year, which means I did not go um, <laughs> because I could have gotten arrested for using the bathroom. Um, but anyway, 
where am I now after this long journey of dealing with pain? Well, I'm back on my feet, going to conferences, and all these healthcare professionals that I see right now are queer themselves or queer affirming, because that's what we look out for, right? We take care of each other. I got facial feminization surgery in January of this year, and recovering from that was a really smooth, thanks to the Spiegel Center in Boston, the facial plastic surgery center I went to, having a patient coordinator who was not the doctor, not me, but an in-between person who walked me through the whole process, um, who was really supportive, and who was trans themselves. Um, so maybe an answer for you, if you want to support trans patients, is hire a trans patient coordinator, depending on your practice. Um, I have a non-binary therapist, nutritionist who's queer and understands the unique ways that eating disorders and gender dysphoria are entangled. And tomorrow, literally tomorrow, I am setting up my first appointment with an openly LGBT-friendly physical therapist so I can learn to get active again, um, which is really great. So I love that journey for me. I want to end with this. Last thing, I swear. Trans people have always existed. That's the motto. Um, the media likes to pretend like we didn't exist until 2015 because of Tumblr or whatever, but science and history tell a different story. These right here that you're seeing right now are newly colorized images from Weimar Germany, Stonewall in the 60s, Japan in the 1950s, the Mexican Revolution in 1915, Brazil in 1897, and so much more if you go to Eli Ehrlich's website. Um, I look at these and I get a little emotional um, because when we let other people in power tell our stories for us, um, our stories get erased. And it's really important that we advocate for trans people in all walks of life. In fact, since we're talking about pain and healing, if you look back in history, a lot of pre-colonial societies, um, trans and non-binary people not only existed, but they were healers. They were priests, spiritual practitioners, the keepers of sacred wisdom, um, look to the various two-spirit traditions of indigenous cultures in America, um, the Hydra in India, the Sangama of South Africa, and all of pre-colonial Yoruba culture, you'll find that gender diverse people are healers, the midwives, the doulas, all these practitioners. So I think the world of medicine can only benefit by embracing the lives and perspectives of trans people. You've been here for a long three days. I think a lot of these talks can basically be summarized as listen to patients, right? <laughs> So if you're here and you're watching, thank you for being here. I love you, especially if you're trans. You are the next link in a chain stretching back thousands of years into the past and thousands of years into the future. Um, if you're a trans person of color especially, your people are sacred and you are a healer. Um, we have always existed and we will always exist and our community will always survive and persist no matter what they throw at us. So I wanna thank you for being here. I wanna thank all the trans people who've helped me grow, and have trusted me with their stories. Um, if you want to learn more about the trans experience, I am a one-woman content powerhouse. I'm on all the platforms, the hub for which is my own personal website. So I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna Marie. That was amazing. I'll do my best. That was wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I want to add a little extra information on the long COVID end, as you all know. Mm -hmm. So if you go as furious as I am right now with the CDC, they have really great data tracking long COVID. So for the pol household pulse survey, they have data that comes out like every few months. And the last one just came out like a week ago. Consistently, you will see trans people, and they do not distinguish by gender, unfortunately, um, always have higher rates of long COVID than where they do distinguish. They say cis, female, male. And this is like, you will see it whether it's people ever, all adults who have had long COVID, who current, or had COVID, who currently have COVID. And then we'll also see that straight people have the lowest rate of long COVID. Next is gonna be gay and lesbian grouped together. And then above that is gonna be bi. And I know personally I'm bi. And I will reach out to my friends because three of my four close friends who are bi have long COVID. I'm like, that is really, really upsetting. The fourth one is actively sick right now. And I'm like texting them like, do not exercise, do not push. So it's a thing to be really aware of. It's just like an extra little thing. And if you need data like to give to other providers, the CDC has it. It's like a really great little chart that you could look at.
And in summer 22, um, in that magazine, which is a queer magazine, I was interviewed for because this really great queer journalist, Miles Griffiths, and he noticed that data and talked to me and other people. And we don't know why. And like you obviously like made some really great points on it. And like more, I guess, on the healthcare end, like we literally don't have the exact why do we see it more in certain populations than others. But people are like raising flags about this. But there, I feel like enough people are not aware of it yet. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Bars. <laughs> Oh, that was in Them Magazine? Them, them like magazine. T H E M. Mm -hmm. uh, summer, is, I think August 22 is summer 22. Okay. Take this back to your professional communities, all of you, because it impacts all of us. Thank you. That was, that was really wonderful. Um, I really admire you. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you know if there's any research into interventions to reduce uh, transphobia? Interventions to reduce transphobia? Yes, like Ooh. any sort of public health campaigns or, you know, like, because you mentioned oh. like loads of ideas and I was just mm -hmm. wondering if there's actually any research to kind of support what's more effective in reducing transphobic beliefs. Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head, especially with regards to healthcare. Um, I, I know there's a lot of research into just like exposure, right? Just like being exposed to new ideas and meeting people face to face who can help break down those stereotypes. Although I will say that if exposure was all it took, um, we live in a totally different world because you know we interact with people of color every day, for example, but it doesn't mean our biases go away. It takes serious internal work um, to undo one's biases and kind of like giving up a habit you have to want to change is the thing. You can have, you know, if, and also I think a lot about the impact of social media. Um, as a content creator who's very skeptical of social media and the way algorithms control everything we do. So if someone is algorithmically attuned to transphobia, it means all the content they're getting is anti-trans, right? Um, and this isn't everyone, obviously, because, you know, not everyone's at this extreme state. But if someone is surrounded by that, you know, content all the time, um, they have to, it's not just easy to tell them, no, stop that. You have to sort of establish a new community, a new set of beliefs, a new set of ideologies. The thing that's difficult about uh, trans education is what does it mean to be a man and what does it mean to be a woman are very fundamental questions. Um, we start whole religions over this stuff. So I can tell you my ideas, but that doesn't mean you're going to ever adopt them. Uh, so they're very challenging. They're getting, in, getting into questions like, what is the self, right? So much of transphobia is rooted in this idea of biological destiny. Like men are destined to be in power and women are destined to be barefoot and pregnant. Like who's writing these destinies, first of all? Um, and it maps onto other beliefs, like it's comorbidities with misogyny and racism and other things. Um, and that's a whole framework of things and it's hard to just undo that, but talking to people is a great first start. With regards to research, I wish I could tell you more, but that's my answer. I just want to start by saying thank you for sharing your story. Um, that was really inspiring, and you're also like, that was hilarious and like heartwarming and all thank these you. emotions. I'm all tight five. <laughs> <laughs> it was really great. Thank you. Um, I work for a, a clinic in Hillcrest, which caters to a lot of uh, the LBGTQ commun community. Um, and I've heard this rift among my patients where some of the LBGQ community is like, why are we getting like wrapped in with, mm. with this trans community and the trans community doesn't want to be affiliated. And I was just wondering mm. that they feel like maybe society is putting this label on them, on, on the whole group. Um, I was yeah. just wondering what you think about that. Oh man, so much. Uh, Inter-community tension is not uncommon. I mean, do all people of color of a certain race agree with each other on every single thing? No. So do all queer people agree on every single thing? No. In fact, we're very famously, there's this perception among the right that trans people are this like unified political coalition that's like invading all government. We can't even <laughs> ask five people what it means to be trans and they'll give you seven answers. Um, we are not as unified as I wish we were. Um, definitely there's inter-community, intra-community tension, um, especially between you know, cisgender gay people and trans people. First of all, largely we get along 
It's only these rare edge cases. It's like, I call it the vegan problem. Like most vegans are chill, but that one who's like very annoying about it stands out and is like, you murderer, because you order a, sam a steak sandwich. Um, similarly, most people are chill. Like there's a stereotype about lesbians of being transphobic. 96% of lesbians polled uh, are very supportive, highly supportive of trans people and transitioning. My partner's a lesbian. There you go. And I identify as a lesbian too, for the record. Um, so it's only these like rare edge cases that have this complicated feelings. Although those complicated feelings can be rooted in some level of validity. You know, if you don't know your queer history, you might think that Marsha P. Johnson in 1969 said, I hereby declare us the LGBTQIA plus community right before throwing the first brick at Stonewall, which she didn't. But anyway, that's a whole other story. But it's a coalition that's formed over a long period of time. First it was founded by trans people of color and then like cisgender gays sectioning off from that and then disavowing them and then lesbians getting looped in and then bisexual people getting looped in in the 80s and then us returning to trans and non-binary acceptance and then going, people going from using the word gender non-conforming to non-binary. It's a very loose coalition. It's not necessarily as cohesive. It's convenient to put us all into one category because it's like stuff related to gender and who you like and stuff. Um, <laughs> But whether LGBTQ is necessarily a completely coherent political block is up for debate. And there are plenty of people who think that we should totally detangle resources for trans people and resources for uh, cisgender queers. But I think we're always stronger together. We're always stronger together, especially considering all the trans people who also identify as lesbian, bisexual, asexual, all these other things. And the fact that, hey, it's not a binary mind-blowing, plenty of non-binary people in between, and people with complicated relationships. Not everyone adheres to these like strict, rigid labels, right? You know, people are very, you know, people say, oh, I'm heteroflexible, or whatever. And other cultures, they don't necessarily use the words bisexual, they just say, oh, I'm fluid, or these sort of other vague terms, but that's fine, you know? There's room for everyone under the rainbow, and I think we're better together. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Mac, and I am Indigiqueer and a massage therapist, and uh, I have been gay, I have been bi, and self-identifying, and if you wanna talk about it later, we can, and I'm a nice vegan. Oh, I do. And, 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 and I'm a nice <laughs> vegan, okay? But at any rate, <laughs> what, I, what I wanted to particularly say is thank you so much for mentioning uh, asexuality mm -hmm. and intersex because those are definitely part of the people under our rainbow or under our tent who are not always talked about. And as a massage therapist, I, am, I must be on my community's list because I definitely do get a fair number of queer uh, you know, clients who I see regularly. And it's simply because from the, I believe, uh, number one, they know me probably because of my husband uh, who is an academic about these kinds of topics, but number two, because I ask people as people, right? I don't make any assumptions about the person coming into my practice space, at, at least that, that I am consciously aware of, right? Obviously, cognitive bias, blah, 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 predictive processing, but um, I try to approach each and every person who I am working with as a person how would you like to be addressed? It's that simple. My name is Mac. He, him are my pronouns. It's really that simple and it can make such a profound difference because as she said, all it takes is one person to truly transform a person's life. I tried to kill myself a couple times. That's another side conversation. There was another person in my life who was there and that's all it takes. Thank you. All Mac, right. Mac, I'm glad you're still here. Me too. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for all of that, and thank you so much for sharing. Um, we're going to move into a little break, and then we'll be back at 4:45 for our final speaker.